Hello, folks, and welcome to the podcast. I have a really inspiring guest today. I met Bobby Robinson a while back via a mutual friend. Uh, Bobby is a rock star attorney and a tech company founder. Uh, Defiance recently acquired in Teledoc, a contract management system he developed first for his own law firm and then commercialized for other firms. Uh, Bobby's a very motivational guy, always energetic and happy. I don't think I've ever seen him upset or stressed. <laughs> <laughs> and he's always busy on social media. I really have enjoyed watching him uh, build out his social media uh, personality through the years. Bobby, thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, man. Thank you so much for having me, John. I'm really excited about this opportunity, so thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. No, I know I know you're, you're a busy guy with all the different things that you have going oh, on, man. so I'm hoping yeah. to get into some of that today. <laughs> just, just trying to be reflective of you, man. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you're too kind. By the way, right now we are sipping on Angel's Envy. Angel's Envy. Bourbon. Um, at some point, we're going to switch to the rye, and I want to get your live opinion on, <laughs> on, on what you like between the Absolutely. two. Absolutely. No, yeah. no rush on yeah, that, though. Yeah, We'll get through this one first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no keg stands with, yeah, the, uh, yeah. with the Angel's Envy. No, no. <laughs> Great. So first off, can you give the listeners your background, your education, your your, your career, kind of how you got here? And you can start as early as, as it makes sense. For yeah, you. yeah. So so I'm originally from South Florida, uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale area, and uh, moved to Charlotte 2012 to, to attend law school at, at Charlotte School of Law. Um, and then, you know, I've been an entrepreneur all my life, right? So I've, you know, endeavored in real estate and uh, professional services with regards to consulting. And, you know, law school has always been something of interest to me. Um, even after I got my MBA, it was just one of those things. I wasn't prepared to do sort of this dual degree scenario. And so I was a non-traditional law student per se with regards to just not going to law school directly after undergrad. Okay. Um, and so I had a lot of professional experience before entering law school. So I was pretty clear in terms of like my path with regards to like, hey, I wanted to do corporate work or I was really interested in intellectual property. Um, and so those were the practice areas in which that I, you know, pretty much funneled my, my uh, courses towards and then after law school, I took a compliance job, um, not quite sure if I really wanted to practice law, even after passing the bar. Um, and then I, I launched my own boutique law practice, um, the Robinson Law Group. And um, it was just a really fun and unique opportunity for me to support, you know, startups and um, other folks, athletes, and, and uh, other professionals with regards to their uh, business endeavors. And so we did a lot of M&A work. We did a ton of business formations and commercial agreements. And then more importantly, we did a ton of uh, trademark work and licensing deals and things of that nature. And so uh, we grew that to a really large, uh, at least large by standards with regards to just a boutique practice. And then the opportunity with my current firm, Next and Pruitt, came, uh, which uh, I, I wasn't uh, looking for. It sort of just just came to me, and it was a great opportunity to come in as a partner in our Charlotte office uh, to to build out that office and to raise the the profile of the firm in the Charlotte market. Uh, and I, I know we'll talk about networking later on. And and so you know I've I've fortunate while I've only been in Charlotte for about eight years, um, I've quickly sort of gotten on the scene and, and made some great connections uh, to include yourself. Um, and I think that was an important aspect in terms of, you know, the firm looking at me and, and kind of what I've what I've built. And so um, and then that sort of leads us into IntelliDoc, right? And so, you know, developed IntelliDoc out of the need to say, you know, hey, there's a there's a need here. And as a small law practice, I really couldn't find a, an M&A tool or a contract tool that was sufficient for a small boutique practice. Everything was sort of on the enterprise level. And I thought that there was a huge opportunity in the small to middle market space for um, a tool such as IntelliDoc. And then as we so this we'll, isn't, this we'll isn't, get sort of into it. At yeah. So this point. isn't a tool that is um, replacing the data room. This is doing something that a data room wouldn't do. This is much more around the workflow management. Yeah. Around this is around right? contracts and the process with regards. And, and when I know we'll, we'll get mm -hmm. into it later on, but you know, as, as a transactional attorney, you know, and you're being an entrepreneur who've had to hire 
lawyers in the past, it's like, you know, we bill by the hour, right? And if lawyers are spending a no, ton of time. No, you bill by the six minutes. By the six minutes, the six minute increment, right? You know that. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they, there you go, right? And so, you know, when you start to think about it, at least from an operational perspective, it's how, how efficient are these contracts and, and, you know, what is our process around approvals and review and so forth. And it could get very expensive and there's great technology around automating these processes. And unfortunately, the legal industry um, is it, fairly uh, slow with regards to adoption of innovative tech. And although we've seen an explosion in tech investments in the legal space, it's relatively still behind the eight ball with regards to where tech is today in many other mature industries. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a huge opportunity for us to really fill a void that was long overdue. And I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into that a bit. Yeah, more. we will. There's so, so many places yeah. I want to take that. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so it's safe to say that you, you always had your eye on law um, you, you, Law you and business, and right? Business, yeah, yeah, it was just a very unique combination. Um, and that's the thing I enjoy. And I feel as though, John, I bring a different level to my clients because, you know, no shade to my, my colleagues who are very brilliant uh, professionals. It's one thing to sort of advise how to form a business. And it's another thing to like build something from the ground up. It's just a, yeah. it's a unique experience, right? And so my clients sort of get both from me. And I don't know how to bifurcate or separate the legal and the business. It's just kind of an all-in-one thing for me. Yeah. No, one of the biggest complaints that a lot of entrepreneurs end up with with attorneys is there's business advice and there's legal advice. And sometimes I'm going to make a business decision that an attorney doesn't understand, that yeah. doesn't see, that yeah. doesn't see eye to eye with. And it's like, I, I understand your business, I, I understand why you, you, you think this, but it may not be, I, maybe I want you to focus on legal right now. And my guess is you can be a lot more pragmatic because you're, you've worked on both sides of that equation. Yes. Right. And that, that's huge. Uh, because if I'm talking to someone such as yourself, you, you have certain priorities, right? You have return on investment, you have reputational risk, you have financial risk. And it's important for me to speak your language mm -hmm within the framework of legal, right? So, hey, John, this is what you can and cannot do. Ultimately, it's a business decision either way. Yep. Um, and you got to make it, but it's my job to really frame it up for you to just sure. kind of understand what you're facing. And then we can kind of talk through the pros and cons of either option. But it's, it's always going to come down to it being a business decision. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. Some of the, the how, uh, complicated things can become yeah. uh, when, when lawyers get involved with it. But the reality is it's much cheaper to think about it ahead of time oh my than when shit goes sideways. Uh, it's, right? it, it's likely to go sideways um, and folks kind of shy away from having those conversations because of those six minute incremental billing. <laughs> uh, but, but you ultimately end up paying so much more, uh, if you don't. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's so important to have those conversations. Lit and, litigators and you, tend to cost a lot more than oh my corporate gosh. attorneys. Oh right? my gosh. Yeah. You'd rather pay <laughs> us. My job is to keep you out of court, you know, and that, that, that's important too. <laughs> so, um, so, so I think you already answered this. So you, you, you typically have practiced M and A law and gotten into the IP side of the house as well. Logan. Yeah, it was fairly organic, right? So, uh, you know, M and A, you weren't seeing a lot of minorities doing corporate M and A, um, and I thought it was just a fascinating thing. It was just an interesting thing for me to get into with regards to the buying and selling of businesses. I just was intrigued by that. Um, and then the IP side, again, a very underdeveloped with regards to representation. Um, and so you didn't see a lot of minorities doing IP work. Um, and so I was just very excited about just intellectual property, trademarks and, and copyrights and all of that jazz. Mm -hmm. And, um, let, let me know, ask you this, yeah. you, I, I was, I'm curious how you did business development because you mentioned you were able to build up the practice and yeah. stay very busy yeah D did you focus on on minority business owners and mi minority stakeholders or what what was the business <sighs> development um, focus um, there initially yes initially i um started working with a lot of minority-owned businesses my firm was certified mm -hmm. um as a minority-owned business I, I i had no clue um 
this whole world of supplier diversity and how a lot of corporations had a number of initiatives to do business. This was sort of pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. There's a renewed interest in that now, but even back then there was still an interest in it. Um, and, and many of those companies had to become certified in order to do business with some of these large enterprise companies. And so we went down that path and um, that sort of opened the door for enterprise, but then it also introduced us to a broad swath of certified businesses that, you know, in many instances, uh, we were the first law firm they've ever even thought about hiring, right? They've never really thought about using Mm -hmm. a lawyer. Um, Many of them may have uh, went to LegalZoom or may have used some sort of online provider, really not necessarily understanding the, the true value proposition with regards to what an online service provider would be versus having a relationship with an actual attorney. And so we were able to sort of story tell around a lot of that, the relationship aspect, and um, that helped us build a lot of continuity. And I think it was just a multiplier effect of every entrepreneur kind of says like, who's your lawyer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's representing you? You're obviously doing great, right? Who, who's kind of helping you? And then it's, you know, it's the accountant, it's the financial advisors, it's that whole, you know, team that you sort of work with. And, and we were able to build a really good network. I'd say about at that time, pre COVID, I'd say 90 plus percent of my business was referrals. We, we really didn't do a whole lot of advertising at some point in time, things were just organically. But, but at some in. point it was less about minority owned businesses. Oh, and now at it's some just point. I'm a it's, startup it's, lawyer. It's a startup yeah. lawyer. Right. Yeah. So at you begin to just migrate as you, you know, dip your toe and me being sort of in the startup space as well. And then folks are like, Oh, you're a lawyer and you're a tech founder. I, I want to do business with you because yeah, you, you understand like, and that goes kind of back to our initial point, you know, you sort of sit in my seat as well. So what have you learned? What have you experienced? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that is very helpful. And so it did sort of migrate into other spaces to where we have uh, at that time, I had a very diverse portfolio of clients. Again, um, startups to middle market, it, it was just kind of, it ran the gamut. So did Nexon and Pruitt acquire your firm and make you yeah. a partner? That's how it yeah, went down. And that's how it went down. Uh, yeah. How was that? And that's my story and I'm sticking to so, it. <laughs> how was that sitting on that now? you know, you've done all of this, these M&A yeah. transactions and now it's your transaction. How yeah. can you speak a little bit to that? Experience? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, um, so, so we, we kind of agreed late 2019 that the transition was going to happen and we had been talking for some time and I knew that I was juggling a whole bunch, right? My firm was in Charlotte, we were in Atlanta and I was doing a lot of traveling between the two cities and we were thinking about going into Florida and other markets. So so there was a lot sort of going on there, and it just made sense for me to work with a lot of larger firm. One of the core selling features or points as to why I, I made the move um, is that uh, Next and Pruitt is a large regional player uh, with international presence. And then I, I would have to farm out, John, a ton of work because I didn't do it right. I didn't do employment work. I didn't do litigation. I, you know, I didn't do environmental or tax law. And so those matters would still come to me. And then I would have to find folks to kind of handle it. Um, And now in this case, I, if it still comes, but I now have a host of attorneys in house that I could turn to, um, to help me with those transactions. And so that was a selling point for me. Um, And then it just gave me a larger platform to work on larger deals from a capacity perspective. And so, yeah, it was certainly interesting to sort of wind down my own firm. Um, And uh, the, 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 the drawback, no fault of anyone, it was really just the pandemic in that I had folks on my team who were gonna come over and we kinda had to put that on pause until, you know, things sort of pick back up because I was, quite frankly, still impacted by impacted by the fact that um, I had some quite a bit of attrition in my, you know, book of business. Right. Sure. Um, and so, you know, uh, and I don't know if you know how law firms work, but partners kind of bring in the money. You eat what you kill, right? You eat what you kill. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, if if I got to make sure I'm whole and before I can start building out my team. And so actually next month will be a year that I've been at the firm. It's been a rapid time. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm still building, right. I'm That's still great. building and learning. Yeah. And, and what is your role primarily now? Because I see that you're doing some things that are more 
kind of influencer yeah. type of behavior. Man, I'm so excited about this question. Yeah. So so we talk about sort of the the market. So so prior to COVID, I was my my practice was split between corporate M and A and uh, intellectual property, right? And I noticed the market shrank, right? When COVID occurred, all of my M and A referral deals, they just weren't it just wasn't happening unless you were in purchasing some sort of distressed business or you were, uh, you know, really good at healthcare acquisitions or spaces that were doing very well. And I did very few healthcare deals. Um, and so I didn't see a whole lot of M and a transactions. I'm starting to see a bit more. So like every great entrepreneur, I had to find a space, um, that was emerging that being social media, um, that really didn't have uh, a ton of uh, saturation with regards to attorneys that were playing in that space. And so me being a millennial attorney mm-hmm. myself, I thought that it was the most appropriate thing for me to kind of investigate um, what are the opportunities from a legal perspective for me to leverage my corporate background as well as my IP background and bring that to social media. And I discovered that uh, brands who are working with influencers have the same needs, right? They have to put contracts in place with influencers. They, uh, the, the content that influencers are producing, that's intellectual property. So that raises some issues. And then, you know, there's, uh, there are legal requirements uh, when, um, you know, influencers are endorsing products. So that's regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. So you probably have seen the hashtag ad and all of those disclosures that are required. And that was really exciting for me. And I'd said, well, gosh, I could, I could literally do this and make a name for myself in this space. And so I created this brand, the influencer attorney. Um, and that's what I've been building. Do you spend more time connecting to influencers or building your own influencer presence? Because I suspect it's a little bit. It's a little bit of both, right? Because I have to raise my, it's, you know, it's such a big blue ocean, right, John, in that um, influencers, it's a fairly new space, right? And so influencers have no idea what they need uh, from a legal perspective. And then brands are still trying to figure it all out, right? Um, and so I have to do a hybrid of the two. I have to let folks know who I am and how I can help them and then make the connection with those individuals. So, yeah, it's, it's a hybrid for sure. Yeah, we, we hear so many people, <clears throat> both investments that we look at at Defiance, but also clients of ours where the influencers are a big part of the marketing strategy. I mean, oh it's, 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 it's very rare that somebody doesn't have some sort of influencer. It's, uh, it's, it's huge. Approach. I was just looking at a, a survey the other day or some sort of market study and it's like, um, it's a $13.4 billion industry now. And wow. I saw somewhere where about 60 plus percent of brands are now taking um, out of their marketing budgets and setting aside and establishing influencer marketing budgets as an independent budget. And I, and I find it very difficult to believe that, you know, the traditional way in which brands have engaged their audience has been, you know, print and billboards and radio and TV commercials. And you can't measure the return on investment, right? But you can with an influencer, with their engagement and the number of sales that you can tangibly see and their ability to move product with their audience. Um, and so I, I really don't foresee this space going anywhere. In fact, I've, we've seen more dollars go into influencer marketing since the pandemic. And I, I really don't think that's going to change once things technically go back to normal, or whatever your, that means. Your opinion, because yeah. I was, as, as luck would have it, I ended up recently making a connection to an influencer that is my fiance's client yeah and we started talking about influencers i was talking with somebody about it and i think they're going to get it worked out and they're looking at hey should i give equity should i give cash and they'll they'll get that all sorted out but i was i was trying to describe let me ask you this do you think of 50 cent famously took a steak in vitamin, and vitamin water. water, which paid off <laughs> tremendously. Is that an influencer or is that a more traditional? No, uh, it, it is. Yeah. And we're starting to see that sort of, so what we're just describing is just the form of compensation, right? Mm-hmm. And we're seeing, um, even with influencers, entertainers, 
who are becoming brand ambassadors, another colloquialism for influencers to say, um, yeah, I can't afford to pay you mm -hmm. um, $100,000 per post, um, but I'm interested in giving you some percentage of the well, company. Well, it worked out for 50, it right? It worked it out tremendously for 50, right? Yeah. But then that, that, that has paved the way for a ton of, uh, particularly startup brands who want to quickly blitz the market and you have a baked in audience it's it's so much easier and quicker to give someone a couple percentage points in the company and then you're on main street with your brand and you're starting to see it with a lot of direct to consumer products mm -hmm. you know whether it just be shoes or you know i don't know supplements or vitamins or whatever it is right so there's yep. so much that you can do um, but it's, it's such a, it's a good space. And, you know, I, I want to, I'm at that age, man. I just want to do something that it, that's fun and exciting and, um, you know, I, I enjoy it. So it's, it's a five month journey so far and it's, it's been going good with this brand. Very cool. Well, I'm sure we're going to come back to, to, yeah. to, to your current, where you're currently spending your time and yeah. the influencer thread, but I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Um, I, I met you. And um, you said, I'm building this technology platform. And I said, what have you done in technology? And you said, well, none. Nothing, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, which, which I think is awesome because you yeah. obviously were able to be successful with yeah. it. Can yeah. you speak to how you went up? So you, you've got this idea for IntelliDoc. You yeah. are the first and best customer for yeah. it because yeah. you own a law firm, yeah. um, which is a great recipe for success, yeah. by the yeah. way, being your own yeah. first best customer. Uh, how do you go about figuring out how do I build a product? Um, it was a lot of um, research. It was a ton of having conversations with folks like yourself, right? Um, a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of conferences at the time. Um, you know, here in Charlotte, we're very fortunate to have a very thriving, you know, startup scene. And um, there were a lot of great opportunities. I would go to pitch breakfast and just sit in and really just try to understand this whole space of just startup and, and tech. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm fearless, man. You know, I'm, I'm like, I, I could figure it out. Right. If nothing else, you're not, well, you're not afraid to stub your I'm toe not, either. I'm not bro. And I'm like, you know, let's figure it out and let's have a conversation. And I, I'm so fortunate to, to be in a position where when you have a great idea, um, the nature of Charlotte, everyone that I reached out to, including yourself, it was, let's have a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Let me, let me tell you what I know. Um, and you were very helpful amongst uh, several others just to kind of help me feel comfortable with making decisions as I put my left foot in front of my right foot. Well, and, and, <laughs> and you didn't raise money for this. You, went, I did not. You paid yeah, for it yourself, I, I bootstrapped it. I bootstrapped it. And that was sort of the investment I had in myself and the belief that I had in this product that uh, we were going to be successful. Um, but I'm not also remiss that that's a very fortunate position for me to be in. My firm was very successful. We were, we were cash flow positive and that sort of helped me sort of underwrite the cost. But I think we're going to get to some comments around just some mistakes. I probably made a whole lot of mistakes in spending money too early or investing in things that I didn't necessarily need to have, but you don't know what you don't know. Yep. Um, and I learned a lot in the process. It was frustrating. I had my moments where I think you and I would grab coffee. I'm like, John, I don't know what to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know, you, you calm me down and give me some, some practical advice and, um, you know, I'd feel better about myself and I feel like I could go and conquer the world again. And we'll, we'll you know, and that's just the cycle of entrepreneurship and you just got to figure it out as you go along. The, and, the uh, highs and the lows, the highs and lows, unmatched. man, it's, it's unmatched. Um, and, 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 and no two highs and lows are the same. You know, because it's like, you know, it was it, it went from issues with sales or 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 product development or, you know, just client engagement. So there's just so many facets of, you know, building this this brand or this company. And um, you I, know. I like to use a metaphor for that. I, I like to think of systems as a series of potential bottlenecks. And for mm. me, it's what is my biggest bottleneck right now? And I'm going to go tackle that. And then I'm going to look at what the next bottleneck is. So to your point, the bottleneck mm. might be product management. Our product sucks. It's not yeah. doing what we said yeah. it's going to do. It's buggy. By the way, we're uh, cracking open the, the rye. How does that taste compared to the bourbon to you? 
The rye is awesome. <laughs> but I like the bourbon and that it's a lot smoother. Uh yeah, it does have definitely more spice, yeah, spice and bite to, to it. it. Yeah. Bite to it. But it's 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 awesome. <laughs> so my vote. My vote is the bourbon. Okay. Okay, that, that, what see, you got? You, what you're do you an have? unconventional thinker. I like the rye, but I, <laughs> but I, 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 I think it's great that you, that, that you think the bourbon's better and you're, yeah, and you're sticking yeah, with I'll it. I stick with it, man. You happen to be wrong. I'm I, joking. <laughs> <laughs> totally joking. You're John. I'll let you get away with it. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm joking. I think they're both great. Yeah, they're uh, pretty great whiskeys. Awesome. Do you know why they call it Angel's Envy? No, I don't. So when they, um, when when you make bourbon or or rye, obviously you you. You um, soak it, or you you store it in in um, oak barrels, uh, and it takes on the flavor of the oak barrel. And depending on the amount of um, temperature variation, that's why Kentucky makes really good bourbon because the the temperature changes dramatically, huh. and the the wood expands or contracts. And the more frequently it does that, the more flavor you get. So that's why you you can age a bourbon for a couple of years in in Kentucky, whereas a Scotch you might have to age Asia. eighteen years in Scotland. Wow. Now what they so. In the process of expanding and contracting, I think up to three percent of the of the product is lost every year to evaporation, and they call that the angel's share. So this is what we get, and the angels don't get it. So oh, the angels, envy it. angels envy! Amazing. You mentioned sort of. I gotta uh, recall the uh, bourbon that's stored in, in the ocean. Have you? Have you? Yeah. So there's a couple. There's Louis Trey, which I Louis think is, Trey it's, it's is a the, Cavassier. It's, it's a Cavassier. Yeah, I have not tried it as of yet, but I've heard it's amazing. It, it, it's amazing. There's a couple other really interesting ones. There's another one that um was the last cognac that was harvested before the locust swarm of 18 something oh my in gosh France, right oh and my gosh <laughs> so there's it, it's john the great historian <laughs> <laughs> i'm probably getting most of this shit wrong so if, if i had todd here i'd have him well, look it up look on it up right yeah. right well, whether that'll decide whether we keep it in or not right so so bobby and i disagree on on our angel's envy but that's fine because cool. they're, they're both great products so you're still my boy <laughs> i appreciate that so um yeah, so so I, now I completely lost track of where we were. We're, we're talking about building the technology product. Um, we're we're um, talking about. I, I was talking about the system of bottlenecks that you yeah. overcome. And so yeah. one minute it's product management. Oh my gosh! And then your next bottleneck becomes. Well, sales. I need to make sales, yeah. and then you make a sale, and then it becomes customer support, yeah. and it, it's a feedback yeah. loop. And I yeah. think. And then it becomes customer retention, right? And so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it, it's this whole sort of life cycle. And then, you know, it's it's a continuum. And, you know, particularly at the phase that we were in, we were sort of still MVP. We're still figuring things out. We're still learning our customers. And again, you know, every industry is different. And so there's this sort of varying degree. And I think you, you know, one of the things I had to learn is just, you know, obviously, when you have limited resources, and you don't want to stretch yourself to too thin, you certainly have to be very strategic. You got to make some very tough calls, and you, you you just don't know whether or not you know you're, you're going in the right direction. And that's that's again um, why I think I'm very very fortunate to have like folks like you in my circle to say, hey John, I I'm really struggling with this man, and I I need some help. And um, you know, and that has been very very helpful, right? You know, just just going through that process. So what what surprised you the most in building a technology product? Was there one thing or a couple things or yeah, I, I think um, for for me, obviously, you, you know that things were just going to cost money, right? Um, but there were just these little nuances of, um, you know, just something silly such as, hey, we're going to do this integration, right? You pay for the integration, but then there's this freaking expensive license that you got to get from the third party to do these other things, right? And so when mm -hmm. you start to factor in the cost, it's like, crap, I didn't factor in another 20 grand for that and then that you're kind of up a creek because you've already done the integration you you hadn't sort of done the next phase of it right yeah. to say and you that, spent money on and the you spend money on the integration yeah. so um so so i think it's really understanding how do we count the cost like hey again it, nothing's going to be perfect and you're not going to sort of know it but at least let's kind of get as close to it as we can um and so that was a very surprising to me and that you know if i had you know 100 grand 200 grand in, in my in mind 
Um, but then it, it balloons to another number. It's like, gosh, you know, how, when is it going to bleed? Is there anything else I need to know about before we go any further? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think that is what most of the time when I talk to technical <laughs> product founders who don't have a technical background, yeah. I, I warn them. I'm like, software costs a lot. It, yeah. You, even expensive. if even if you know what yeah. you're doing, yeah. it's just expensive. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the biggest challenges the technology industry has ironically is yeah. that products work so well when you think about how gmail works it it works in offline mode it works in online, online mode, mode. Yep. it works on mobile yep. it's fast it's response you think about facebook and the sheer volume of transactions they're processing but what you don't see is the hundreds of the millions of dollars that these <laughs> that these teams have built and yeah. the size of the teams oh that they've gosh. got things yeah. things that look easy are never easy. I, th- mm-hmm. I talk about Michael Jordan dunking a ball mm-hmm. would make you think it's easy to, date, to yeah. make a dunk. Yeah. It doesn't just because he makes I it look easy. It. Can't do it, man. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, that, that that's one thing that I think does surprise a lot of people is just seemingly simple things that become expensive to mm-hmm. do. I think the other thing is that a lot of people tend to stub their toe a little bit on, let me spend money before I need to. And Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> I, I did that, right? And you, you can kind of, um, you know, put things, uh, you know, the, the cart before the horse, right? Not really mm-hmm. understanding what it is. And I, I was sort of a, that was the other thing that, that surprised me, how, how bad I needed a co-founder. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, I think we talked about this. If I could do things over, that would be one of them, is to find a co-founder early. Um, well, let's talk about yeah. that because you ended up connecting with with Chris Elmore. I think we're fine to yeah. talk about that because yeah. it was it was yeah. clear. It was clear. It yeah. was clear yeah. for the uh, for the announcement. Yeah. So f- for folks who don't know, Chris is um, a, a character uh, <laughs> employee. <laughs> Putting number, it mildly. One, one of the we first, love you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I just had a had a drink when actually he 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 was doing sober. You know, he, he oh had a couple yeah, months, it was like dry uh, something, dry right, January dry or something. Yeah. So, I, so I had a drink and he he hung out with me, but um. But Chris was on my podcast, one of the first employees at Avid Exchange. He's an entrepreneurship professor and just a really, really good startup resource. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just just uh, really well known around mm-hmm. town. So ha- talk to me about how you thought about your relationship with Chris, because he seemed to be the most important part of your team from that thought leadership oh, perspective. Man. Chris was everything for me, man. Um, you know, uh, not take away the fact that you were on my advisory board <laughs> and all that good stuff. So, um you know, it's it's funny because, you know, Chris and I, we met uh, happenstance at a networking event. Um, what are those? What are those? We you haven't, we haven't had it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how do we do that nowadays, right? Um, so, so it, and it was sort of a very much like you and I. It just, it just sort of deepened mm-hmm. over the years. And um, when I was building IntelliDoc and I, I correlated the the automation with what was happening at Avid, um, Chris immediately kind of got on board, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, whatever you need, just just call me. Um, and, and he and I would have those same conversations, right? I think I would have you guys on like speed dial back to back. Okay, <laughs> let me call John. Let me call Chris. Okay, I'm going to take what I want from these conversations and execute on it, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but he, over time, you know, he really... And for the record, he, yeah. Chris isn't really a technology guy. I think he understands Stands technology. Tech, yeah. yeah, he definitely understands Sales it. Sales is... S- thing. Sales, is, sales his thing. is his thing. I think thing. he said he's given over sixty five hundred presentations oh my gosh. on Avid. Sales is his thing, man. Um, he's an I, animal. I, yeah. He's he's a beast when it comes to sales. He gets the value prop. I think psychologically, he connects with the customer to really understand their pain points and really just strips it down to which that it's hard to say no, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, so so that's where it goes goes to your point. I'm great, John, at a lot of things. I had to really beef up my sales muscles, mm-hmm. right? And I had to become a, a selling founder. Every founder has, you just got to do it. There's, you can't, there's just, you can't outsource it, right? And, and I tried that, right? And it just didn't work. I mean, you, you need to sell until you're the, until you become the bottleneck. Absolutely. Because only you can sell it. Only and until, I can sell it. Yeah. And I thought that to, to, my, to your point earlier, me being an attorney, I could relate, obviously, with my customers, particularly in legal departments and law firms, and I think that that certainly helped open a lot of doors. But there's a science to this whole sales thing as well, and I thought Chris 
had a really good formula and does have a really good formula. And over time, it became obvious to the two of us where our strengths and weaknesses lie. And it just made sense for us to, to do business together. And so I'm really excited to have him on the team. And, you know, he's, he's opened a lot of doors that, you know, he, you know, he was very instrumental in nudging also on the defiance sure. front as well. You know, the fact that I've known you for so many years, I've never once broached that topic. So um, <laughs> it, kudos it is, to Chris. It, it, it's a hard conversation to have because yeah. I, I feel like you're a friend. Yep. Agreed. Like, I mentor you to some extent, but yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah. you know, I, I think that was earlier yeah. on. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of situations like that. We yeah. recently acquired um, Mike Prevets from yeah. Um, yeah. Fraction Consulting and same thing. Mm -hmm. Mike and I work out every, every Saturday and it, and this is where having a partner who is every bit as bought in as you are is Absolutely. very helpful because Absolutely. as soon as we make the connection that, Hey, there might be something here. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm here for you to talk to. I'm here. I was there for Mike, but it's, yeah. Hey, you're going to work with Tarek and Tarek and I are so on the same wavelength that yeah. it just works. It works, know? man. It, it's hard to find partners. It, like that, it does. Know? And it, you know, I, I always say, you know, timing was everything, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you and I have been friends for years, right? You were there when it was just like, and I don't think I even put the damn thing on paper by the time I had <laughs> spoken to you, right? But you were always supportive, right? Making connections, having coffee. I can't tell you how many damn coffees we've had. Com and, uh, and it was over there on Commonwealth. <laughs> What's it called again? It was like uh, Central. Co was it? No. Central? Well, Central. We did a we lot. Did a that lot. was on. That's on. Cent the original was Central Avenue, and then maybe. Oh, the. But the but right, then there's one on Commonwealth that we met a couple times. I, I can't believe I, I'm, I I'm blanking on it. It's, it's been so many times. Yeah. I blame it on the rye. I, right I blame it on that. <laughs> right <laughs> on the rye. It, um, but but you know. It can't be my age. No, I, I you <laughs> notice I didn't go there, right? <laughs> so, but, but, you know, it, that was important to me, you mm -hmm. know, preserving the relationship because you were so selfless with your time. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was important to me that I respected that right at all times. And it's still that way to this day. I think that's good um, networking advice yeah. in general, because yeah. there are some networkers who only take and don't give yeah. Yeah. and who only think about what's in it for themselves and they don't respect the, the time and mm -hmm. for someone like myself who's been in the scene for a while yeah. I, I quickly yeah. figure out the people oh, who are are, <laughs> are, are are not respectful of time and i and yeah. i try to avoid those yeah, um, yeah. now i, I want to dig a little bit more deeply into this because i think you're a very good networker yeah. but i'd like to just real quickly before we come back to that talk about a couple of, of quick topics. Yeah. What will you do differently when you do this again? Because I know you, Bobby, this isn't yeah. your last tech no, product. No, I actually have two <laughs> more ideas I want to talk to you about. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, as I stated earlier, I, I would certainly get a co-founder mm -hmm. so much sooner, right? Like, I don't care about equity. We're going to grow. We're going to build. Um, let's just establish a team. And just based on all the pitches that I've done, um, I knew that was a dig mm -hmm. on me, that I was just a sole founder, right? They love me. They love the product. But it was also important that I build out the team. And mm -hmm. so I would I would definitely do that differently. Um, I would also take a bit more time on um, really deeply understanding and flushing out my customer journey and stories. We did a lot of it, mm -hmm. but I thought we could do more. And while we still learn during some of our initial client and customer onboarding, I would probably just spend a little bit more time intimately peeling back the onion a bit more. Um, I think we had some great intel, right? But I also think that we could have probably done a bit a better job on that piece yeah. of it. Um, so, so those two things for sure, because it's, it's all about the customer, right? They're not if, if it's not really solving a problem, because I think our, our MVP was great. Right. But I also feel as though we probably did some integrations and things that could have waited mm -hmm. and I could have invested those dollars into something else that was a bit more meaningful. Prioritization is a correct, tough one. Correct. Yeah. Right. So I, I think kind of now hindsight 2020. I'm like, oh, did we really need to do that? Mm -hmm. Probably not, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and so, so yes, there, there are a lot of mistakes. And, and then I think, too, um, you know, being more gracious on myself, 
right? Because, you know, you start to see this market validation of your product with all these other companies kind of raising money and kind of, you know, all this stuff is happening around you. And it's like, crap, when's our time going to come? Like, you know, and it's like, just be patient. Like, don't rush the process, kind of go through the process, um, refine these things and, and, and the opportunities will come. And, you know, the relationship with Defiance kind of was at the right time. Very cool. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned um, that angle, seeing competitors raise money. I, yeah. I mentioned to you last night, we I did an interview with Alex and, yeah. Yeah. and Dan from um, from 2U Laundry. And one of the things Alex talked about in this interview and the first one that I did with him is he watched Washio yeah. and Rent yeah. go raise, yeah. I think, a combined $30, 30 million, million. Dollars yeah. going after, I, I've, I've going after this that. market. Yeah. And you can sit there and you can say, you know what? I'm, I'm screwed. Yeah. Or you can say, well, this validates it's valid. what I'm doing. It's, it's Let validation. me do it in a more scrappy way. Absolutely. And that's, that's exactly how I viewed it to mm -hmm. say, look, if those guys can, can raise money on what I believe is a, a, not an inferior product, but it's not really solving mm -hmm. a, a, a true problem. I, I think we have something here and I think we need to continue down this path. And I was very inspired by that, mm -hmm. knowing that our time was going to come. And when the market knew about our product, it, it would be a good thing. And so I was excited about it. It's funny. Um, another of my repeat guests, I, my second guest ever was Maggie Williams. Yeah. From Skip Town. Yeah. Skip Town. And yeah. I, and I, when I interviewed her, I, I'm interviewing her again on Wednesday oh, to talk about her pivot. So is that a three peat? That, no, that's a two peat. Two peat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I, I I'm going to have to do a pre-workout drink to get ready for oh, that yeah, one. Cause she's yeah, a ball yeah, of fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's awesome though. She's no, awesome. she is. She's, she's amazing. Awesome. Um, but, but when I talked to her the first uh, time, she goes and raises seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is yeah. no small feat, especially yeah. oh for a gosh. female entrepreneur yeah. Yeah. in a dog walking yeah. space. And then, I think I want to say a month later, um, SoftBank announces a three hundred million dollar investment in their biggest in, in a competitor. Mm. <laughs> and it was it, it was you you can just imagine you you feel good that you raised seven hundred fifty thousand. Let's be yeah, honest, raising so any that's, amount that's, of money is amazing. That's but, amazing. But then you yeah. see three hundred million, and yeah. um, and and she said, you know what? Like we've we we can get in there. We can be smart with our money. Mm -hmm. We we can and and look, SoftBank in many ways imploded yeah. since then, and that was yeah. one of their bets that did not work, work out. out. So I don't yeah. think that a company raising we we celebrate companies raising money as we should. Um, but let's not lose sight of what we actually want to do, which isn't just raise money for money's sake. It's how do we build a great company that sustains for generations and creates wealth for everybody involved in it, right? Yeah, we could talk all day, right? So so that whole notion of sort of glorifying raising money is like a whole nother tangent of a topic, right? Because <laughs> it's like, you know, can you do it, bootstrap? And you're, you're starting to kind of hear more of a, you know, build out of an infrastructure of, yeah, let's, let's kind of go the bootstrapping route, not, not raise capital. Right. Yeah. But, um, there is something if, to, to be said though, with your com competition raising a crazy amount of money. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and knowing, you know, that there's this whole TAM told, you know, total just mark market out there for you to kind of like raise the cap on that thing. And it, that part is like, dope and exciting yeah. right to, to to know that and so the, it just means the sky's the limit if, if you do it the right way Ab absolutely um do now we we talked about it did did you raise money along the way i did or not it was all bootstrap it so was do, all do you bootstrap, wish you had done man. that differently at any point no or? okay no no i you know i'm not a fan of you know obviously giving away um equity very early Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's something to be said, certainly about folks who, you know, believe in your vision very early on and willing to, to, to take a risk on you. But I, I'm just ready to take a risk on myself. Yeah. Right. I, I feel as though if I take the risk, it, it mitigates your concern that I, I don't have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Right. And I need to have skin in the game. And that was sort of my. By the way, have My, you read the book Skin in the Game? I haven't. It's a collection of essays by Nassim Nicholas Tlaib. Have you read? He's Black Swan and I've um, read Black Anti Fragile. Swan. I've yeah. read Black Swan. So, so you ought to you ought to read Skin in the Game. He I talks a to. lot about in any in anything, not just in industry, but politicians. Hmm. Um, he he frames a lot of a lot of 
where we introduce tail risk into uh, systems uh. and he frames a lot of his other concepts around this notion of you want to be you want to work with people who have skin in the game so you mentioned Man. skin in the game <laughs> and i think i think skin in the game is one of the most important topics there's a difference between and i talked about this with alex and dan last night there's a difference between the relationship alex has with dan because dan mm. Skin, skin in the game, it. and so does Alex, Absolutely. and even your top employees. Absolutely. And and we, you know we we want to think of everybody as a partner, but at the end of the day, there are people who have skin in the game, and that it's a different mindset. We we move differently mm -hmm. when we have skin in the game, right? I mean, it's it's no small feat to put six figures into a business, mm -hmm. and then it's like this damn thing cannot work <laughs> out, right? And then that means it has to work, yeah. right? We got to figure out how to make this thing work, and so. Um, you know, so for me, that was important, right? Mm -hmm. So when I came to an investor, it wasn't about, you know, I have this idea that I'm so passionate about, right? And that people are interested in. It's like, no, I've, I've put my own money behind this thing. And um, so, no, we, we did not raise any capital. Not to say that I didn't try, though, mm -hmm. right? I, I did have an opportunity to get a, a million bucks from a, a VC firm out of Alabama, um, but I would have to move to Alabama. I love Charlotte. We just built a house here a few years ago. So um, I love Charlotte too. Yeah. I, I have a friend actually, a very good friend from grad school who moved down to Birmingham for yeah. a startup. Yeah. And it's actually, yeah. it's yeah. not bad, but I like Charlotte better. I do. I do. So I, d I had to politely decline after months of going through due diligence and all that stuff. But, um, so there were opportunities for us to raise. Mm -hmm. Again, it was, I, I wasn't hard pressed to mm -hmm. raise just because I was okay with where we were, but I, I was certainly actively pitching the company for mm -hmm. capital. So I want to address the elephant in the room. Um, yeah. and, and you mentioned George Floyd, but minorities, especially African Americans are underrepresented in, in tech. Yeah. Um, first of all, I guess my first question based on an earlier comment is, are they more underrepresented in law or in tech and startups? Both, man. Uh, yeah. I'm like a, I'm like a, <laughs> a unicorn. A, a unicorn in both. <laughs> well, so so there's this stat that every, we all minority lawyers like to quote. It's like we make up like five percent of the profession, mm -hmm. and like even in the corporate space, it's it's even less IP, even mm -hmm. less, right? So I, that sort of supports my initial sort of thesis around like why I chose corporate and IP initially coming out of law school because I knew. Um, we were fairly underrepresented, but we were actively in these spaces. And it was at a time where we're always looking for, as you know, we do business with people we know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes we do. I business. saw Killer Mike up, started, Killer Mike. started, a, started a, bank <laughs> a bank in Atlanta. Right. Yeah. Right. All of it. Yeah. All of it right. Performing artists. <laughs> so, so, and that's, that's, that's a phenomenal, you know, business model. And so um, folks are, are actively looking for that. And so, you know, to, to get to your point, we are very much underrepresented in these spaces, but I'm certainly encouraged now that you were starting to see this coalition of, you know, banks with very initiatives, VC funds. Um, we have a long way to go, right? Um, you know, it's certainly disheartening to see folks who um, can write an idea on the back of a napkin and raise crazy money. And then, you know, minorities have to, you know, check every box, yeah. Right. And if I, um, I think women owned businesses, women owned businesses are the same. Right? But, but I want to get to that because that brings me to a concept that I've I, I've had my eyes open, especially by our mutual friend, Rod Garvin. Rod yeah, did yeah, introduce yeah, us he while did. he was yeah. with the chamber. Shout out to Rod. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Rod. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that there are opportunities that look, wh whether you should do it because it benefits you yep. or not, there are yep. opportunities. Oh, man. And, and Rod opened my eyes to this. I, I hired Rod to do a, 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 a DNI initiative for Level mm -hmm. fairly early on because yeah. we were yeah. we were admittedly a very white, very male company. Mm -hmm. And not, I don't, obviously we had some biases, but I, I don't, I don't, I think that we were fairly open-minded. It is, sure. it is just, it, it is hard in technology to find, you know, to, to, to be more inclusive yeah. for yeah. a variety of reasons. It's, it's no excuse. They're, they're, they're just, it, it does happen. But I said to Rod, I said, Rod, I told my recruiter that I yeah. want to, I, I, I want, you know, 20% of our candidates to be minority. Yeah. And I want, um, yeah. I want to make five offers and I want to hire two people. And we ended up with, three candidates who had massive offers from Google or Microsoft that we couldn't compete with. Wow. 
and and wow. and and Rod looked me in the eye, and you know Rod. <laughs> He's like, "Well, John, where are you recruiting?" Yeah, and I yeah. said, "Well, Duke." UVA, yeah, oh, and UNC, yeah. no. and he's like, huh, you, and you, you didn't find any no, black campus. Yeah, you, you ain't gonna get no black. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, but that that's so important. But, though, but right? and, and again, I try to. Be, I think I'm open minded about you, these things. You are, but you but are. but, I, but it, it didn't occur to me. And then I said, okay, well, let's go to Johnson C Smith and Howard University uh-huh. and start recruiting there. And yeah. the business opportunity, the, there were candidates that aren't getting looks from Microsoft and Google. They're not, and They're not. I'm sure it's changed since sure. then. But we yeah. found way more candidates just by taking that simple step. The other interesting thing that I noted along that that just happened recently, I caught up with a firm out of the UK that I'm friendly with, uh-huh. and they own a portfolio of 17 businesses, a variety of digital industries. Uh-huh. And and I asked them how, how, is, how, how have things been, and um, you know, very white British guys, but, yeah. but he yeah. said, he's like, you know, John, we, I, one of our products is just taken off. He's like, I will call it dumb luck. We decided it's a communication tool and a collaboration and learning management tool. And he's like, we decided a year ago that we were pivoting it towards diversity and inclusiveness. Wow. And he said, wow. we've, we've rolled out, like we rolled out the, that, that module in the software, like literally a month before George Floyd happened. And he said, we now every single company that wasn't taking our calls they, they need it. And so, so I think that I, w- I would say to other entrepreneurs and investors, yeah. don't do this out of a sense of it's something that you owe or that you need to correct for past mistakes. Do it because there's opportunity in this, right? There's um, a lot of opportunity, but more importantly, deserving opportunity, mm-hmm. right? You, you know, we mentioned earlier that um, I, I'm fortunate, right? I, I was fortunate that I built a law firm mm-hmm. that was able to sort of underwrite the cost of this platform mm-hmm. historic my background i i come from poverty mm-hmm. right and so you know i'm sort of the quote unquote black swan of, of my family right? <laughs> <laughs> in the sense of you know i'm i'm the success story right mm-hmm. um and and i think it's important that you know there there are a lot of you know black coders and you know but then more importantly how do we get off the investment hump right i, yeah. I can't i have a great idea I can't even get the funding to kind of get it off the ground, right? Mm-hmm. Banks won't lend to tech companies, so I got to get private money. And no one in my family, you talk about the, the succession of funding, right? You know, it's like friends and family. No one in my family has $10,000 laying yeah. around. So how am I supposed to, like, make this work? I don't know any wealthy people in my network, that's the hard and part is uh, what we tell everybody is yeah. get as far as you can with friends and family. Well, if you're starting, if you're starting, if you're starting behind, behind and you don't have friends who have made you, what, half a what million do I, dollars, what do I do? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so, so to your point about there are founders out there who are super talented, committed and dedicated. And, but for the lack of funding, those products will never get to market. And mm-hmm. I think we're doing ourselves a disservice by not providing the appropriate amount of resources and support uh, and investing in those companies. And I think it starts with, you know, making sure you have women and black and brown folks mm-hmm. running these funds who are, you know, sensitive to the plight of what's happening. It's no fault of anyone's, right? But but we have to create the opportunity and it's important for all well, of us. Well, it's the fault of some people, just of not course, people who are living of today. Living today. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> and so, but it's important for us to be mindful of that. And then more importantly, as opportunities arise to say, yeah, we're going to take it. And it's not even taking a chance, right? You evaluate that deal like you would any other deal. Yep. The fact that they're a black or brown or a woman founder should be irrelevant. Well, and I think that's what people who want to do the right thing get wrong. And I think it's what I got wrong until I, you know, hired Rod to help me out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, my yeah. heart was in the right place. I just wasn't looking in the right place. Of course. Right? And, and 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 that's the thing, right? It's mm-hmm. like you know, where do we look? Whether it's an attorney, like you know, corporations say, well, I can't find black attorneys to do blah, blah, blah. Have you used the internet to Google? Yeah. I, uh, I, I would go back to Rod <laughs> Garvin. Where are right, you right. Where are you looking, right? <laughs> you know, if you're using the same recruiters and they're only going to the same schools, 
And, and that one kudos certainly to to plug next and Pruitt. And that's something that we've been considering, right? You know, are, are we recruiting from HBCUs? Are we really putting ourselves out there to really develop the pipeline of legal professionals that are women and diverse? Then you got to go where they are, right? We know that as business one-on-one. If I'm, mm-hmm. you know, if I want to connect with entrepreneurs, where are the damn entrepreneurs? And wherever they are, that's what I where I want to be. Whatever they're reading, I need to be in those publications, right? And so the same is true when you're sourcing talent, um, if, if you're not there. But then more importantly, if we're looking on the website and we don't see diversity and it doesn't match up to your messaging that you're diverse and inclusive, we're not coming there. Yeah. Right? We're not coming, right? Because, I, I mean, so so that's important too. That, that, that was what one of our investors, pretty early on at level, we were really on fire and going yeah. get like gangbusters. And and luckily we had an investor, white, rich mm-hmm. Male, yeah. you know, middle aged male, yeah. not even middle aged. He's probably the age I am now, but he. Not to he, cut you he, off, but this, it's it's growing on. It's me. growing on. <laughs> that, that angel's rye is no it's joke. Good. It's damn good. It's, it's, or damn it's, good whiskey. It's, it's growing on. <laughs> so, um, no, but but our investor, he he called me up one day and he's like, "Look, John, I don't think you have biases. I don't think you have like he's like I think you're a fundamentally good human being, but yep. he's like." it is embarrassing to look on the website right now. We look very white, very elitist. Uh-huh. He's like, and and that works when you're selling the way we're selling, but we're, the way we want to sell, he's like, you're going to have an SVP at a bank or, or an SVP at Verizon or at yep. AT&T, or you're going to have, Absolutely. And, and, and there's no, he's like, you don't have, he's like, if, if you don't have it well represented, and he's like, the good news is we, I think we can fix it now. And that's yeah. what drove us to hire sure. Rod. We were just very lucky to have sure. an investor who thought yeah. that way. And, yeah. and, and that, to me, that's what you need investors for, not just for diversity and inclusiveness, but you, yeah. in general, they need to help you see around the corners that you don't see because you're so focused on, I just want to build the business and build a team. Well, I'm, guess what? I'm going to call the people who are around me. But, and then, but the problem is if you get to 200 people and you look like that, you're never going to fix, fix it. Yeah. It's tough. And, and, you know, the other part too about diversity and inclusion, it's just good for business, mm-hmm. right? So to your point, yeah. you don't um, want a monoculture. You, you yeah. don't, <laughs> you don't, man. And yeah. and I think that you know, folks bring so much to the table, mm-hmm. um, and and that you know, with all the crap that's just going on, it's it's just folks are just good human beings who just need an opportunity. Mm-hmm. To bring to live their best life, right? And and sometimes there are these these barriers, right? Very well intended. Um, it, we just got to do some course correction, and that that is applicable in tech. It's applicable in legal, um, and I think people are starting to sort of wake up to to these issues. But I I I do feel as though we still got a long ways to go. So let me ask you this, not to put you on the spot, but are there any yeah. resources that you found useful for minorities in particular looking to get into either law or technology? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, so so on the, the legal side, I definitely reach into bar associations. There are some, you know, minority affinity groups and there are some minority uh, leadership legal groups uh, that you could join and be a part of. I also think just reaching out to uh, minority attorneys, whether they be women or black or brown folks who mm-hmm. are interested in just mentoring and having a conversation with you. I get tons of law students who reach into me on LinkedIn. And I think that's great advice. My, my, my fiance yeah. is, a, is a, yeah. a Latina and very successful real estate agent. Yeah. And she's killing the game out there. She's, ki- she's killing it. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> she, she's doing really well. And yeah. any any Latina that want or woman who wants to get into real estate, she will take their call. Oh, man. They, just to, they just have to, they just have to reach around. out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. They got to reach out. And I, that happens. And I owe it. I owe it, man. I owe it to them because I, I will say everyone that I've always reached out to, and I've had a few that, that haven't been responsive, but for the overwhelming majority folks have always been responsive to say at minimum, I'm willing to get on a call and have a conversation. Right. Mm-hmm. And my path is non-traditional. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't have all the means. I didn't go to a tier one school and I didn't. Neither did I. I, George Mason. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So, so, so nevertheless, uh, we did okay for ourselves. We, we, we made okay for ourselves. So. 
That's awesome. How long have you been in Charlotte again? I know you mentioned it earlier, but uh, yeah, I, I got here 2013, 2013. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. How has the city changed for better or for worse since you got here? And, and not necessarily strictly from the diversity yeah, perspective, but yeah, just yeah, broadly yeah. speaking. Broadly speaking, man, I, I love Charlotte, man. You know, coming from like Miami, Fort Lauderdale, I love that <laughs> vibrant lifestyle. But Charlotte is it's it's me. Right. It's it's enough a vibrancy, um, There's but also energy, has right? a, yeah. a chill <laughs> to it. Right. Um, and I've, I've just seen the explosiveness. I mean, I, I remember getting here and, and, you know, uptown was cool, but then now it's like, it's, well, it's, back it's explosive, then South, South end was just starting, starting to have more than a couple. Yeah. Of restaurants. I, I don't even think they had finished the light rail by that time. Wow. I, um, wow. but, but, um, yeah, they I definitely love, didn't have the yeah, blue line that no, runs up to university. No, no they didn't. And, um, yeah, I, I love Charlotte. I, I think it's a great – and that was the whole point of, like, moving to Charlotte, right, because I felt like as a young professional I could grow with the city. It was, you know, it was like D.C., Atlanta, Houston. You know, we had looked at other markets and, um, you know, Charlotte. And most of our family is still in Florida, so – um, it wasn't too much of a hassle for us to get back home. And uh -huh. um, so it just made sense. And so we love it, man. In fact, we, we actually live in Harrisburg, but I spend most of my time in Charlotte. <laughs> so I still claim Charlotte. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I live in Marvin and I still yeah. claim Charlotte. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so you, you mentioned the pitch breakfast and mixing it yeah. up in the Charlotte startup and tech scene. How involved do you try to do you try to stay now with your new role at, at Next and Pruitt? Do you, do you still go to those meetings? Do you still? I, I, it's I mean, been, obviously, it's been, they're virtual yeah, now. Yeah, but, yeah, it's, it's been hard. Um, it's been hard for me. I used to be the yeah, consummate networker, man, and it's I, I can't do a Zoom networking event. It's, it's I'm sorry. hard. It's hard, and that's that's kind of that's that's been the challenge for me. So yeah, I, I've not been as actively involved. I, I you know of course you know I read Charlotte Business Journal. I, you know, I try to Charlotte follow. Charlotte and O. Yeah, yeah, Charlotte and O and all that good stuff. And so I, I try to follow at least like the news aspect of it, but I haven't like been to like virtual events and things yeah. of that nature. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to just the opportunity because, I, yeah, I'd always bump into you at these networking <laughs> events, right? Yeah, I, I try to go. I, I explain to people like you, you, you take meetings, you take calls, you go to events that you really don't want to go to because you don't know when you're going to meet the next Bobby Robinson, when you're yeah. going to meet the next Chris Elmore, yeah. right? Like it's, yeah. that's the, the nonlinearity of this journey requires that you invest in, in those things. And for me, the zoom is just impossible. It's to impossible. Meet it, it's, it's not as personable, mm -hmm. right? You and I are very relational. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard to really get to know someone. Um, there's no substitute for coffee or angels yep. envy, right? There's no <laughs> substitute for it. Um, so, so I am, I'm definitely, and I, you know, I consider myself, Johnny, you probably disagree with this, but, um, very introverted, right. To some degree. I'm not surprised to hear that actually, yeah. but please go yeah. forward. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, outwardly you're, yeah. you're extroverted, yeah, I'm but, I, extroverted, but I suspect but, you, it's, yeah, it, it it's, probably saps your energy. It does. Yeah. It does. Right. Because, you know, I'm as, the same way. as entrepreneurs, yeah. it's like, we have to, it's just part of what we have to do. Yeah. Um, but but I didn't realize how much I missed sort of going to the net. It became such a fabric of my routine yep. that, um, you know, it was it, it's something that I've missed. So I'm certainly looking forward to it. But, yeah, absolutely, man. If if I didn't have to do it, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's probably why you and I get along so well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I enjoy speaking in public. I enjoy moderating panels speaking on panels yeah um, it takes a lot of preparation yeah it takes a yeah. lot it takes a lot of preparation yeah. Yeah. and and through the years i've gotten better about not having to as much but sure. it, it exhausts me there's it, nothing it more exhausting than going it, and shaking hands with 100 here. people that you don't same know. here bro i'm ready to go i'm ready to go <laughs> so so you, you you probably don't have one given you know the your, your answer on that but are there are there any startups right now that you have your eye on yeah, it's, it's been hard, but of course, I think we have a mutual friend, uh, Desmond, with Battery Exchange. I need um, to get him on, on yeah, the podcast yeah, next. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, so I've been, he's been doing phenomenal, and I've been watching him. And, Talk about and, a guy getting thrown a curveball. For those who don't know, <clears throat> Desmond owns a battery company where he literally, he manufactures in China these battery kiosks. So if you're at an, a public event and you're running out of power, you can 
basically he partners with the venues to deploy these kiosks where you can then charge your battery and then he shows you display ads. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. But Jesus Christ, could you oh, have man. a worse, worse like COVID? <laughs> <laughs> no one's moving around. Yeah, no one's, no one's moving going around. To no one's going to no conferences. Of people. But, he, but he's chugging along yeah. and I can't wait yeah. to hear it. I, I, I haven't even reached out to him yet, but I'm <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, he's in my next round of people that I want to interview. Yeah, he's, he's definitely going to be a success story mm -hmm. for sure. He just and has I, it. I don't oh know gosh. what it is, but he oh has gosh. it. Yeah. He's, he's awesome. Um, <laughs> So, so apart from him, I haven't really had an opportunity to really like identify like the next up and coming. Mm -hmm. I, I may just be that, that next thing. So. <laughs> well, I hope so. I can't wait to hear about it. We'll have you back on here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so for a tech entrepreneur, somebody who has a technical background, kind of the opposite of, of, of where you were, but they yeah. want to build legal technology, what advice would you have for them? Understand the industry, right? I think it's also important to just understand the language of your customers kind of what their pain points and challenges, it, it, you know, th there's this, there's a formula to it to some degree, mm -hmm. right? You know, and so um, that was interesting because, you know, I'm in that space. I kind of understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it made it a lot easier for me to articulate kind of what, what that value prop is. So, yeah, whatever space it is, I think you just really got to intimately understand the issue. But then more importantly, you can't be stagnant in terms of what the issues are today. Kind of, mm -hmm. you got to forecast, right? Kind of, where is the space going? What's happening, yep. right? And, and I think that's important. And I, that's going to be very intuitive with regards to how we develop this product, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to build a platform that's like 10 years behind and before we even get out the gate. Yeah, well, I, I liken it to, you remember Microsoft's Zoom? Yeah. Or yeah. Zoom, what was it called? It was, they, they built an MP3 player. Ah. And it was an amazing MP3 player. The problem was they <clears throat> they built it to be the iPod killer, but mm. Apple had moved on from the iPod, and it was now on the iPod. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the they had the one that was just that had no display, display and it would just it. and yeah. it would just randomly yeah. play songs from your list. To the shuffle is it the shuffle? The that shuffle, was it. yeah, and, yeah. And, and it was interesting because Microsoft. Why did I remember that? They, I don't know. they deployed the resources to kill the iPod after Apple already killed the iPod, and you don't want to do that. Do you that. don't want to spend billions of dollars, yeah. or in in our case, hundreds of thousands of dollars, solving a problem that it doesn't exist that, that isn't going to exist in five yeah. years. You know? Yeah, and and so I I think to to say that I think that's universally applicable, right? To, mm -hmm. to, but you got to be intuitive. I think it, you can't be so, you know, heavy handed that mm -hmm. you're just trying to take this one thing out because it's like whack-a-mole, right? Tech is growing and it's expanding so quickly. Yep. Um, and if you're not sort of abreast to kind of where it's going, you'll be left behind. Yep. So th this, this is all good. I want to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about M&A since you've practiced that. What size companies do you typically represent? Yeah. So, so um, most of my companies were, most deals were less than 15 million, mm -hmm. um, you know, and fairly industry agnostic. Um, I've done buy side, sales side, uh, really didn't matter for me. So you don't have a preference on, because a lot of people, and then my, my fiance included yeah. as, a, as a, but you're law, not, yeah. not the, the yeah. investment banker. But in her case, she's, <laughs> she, she much prefers to list houses because if you list a house, you, you don't it. have to sell it. Yeah. If, you, if you represent a buyer, yeah, they yeah. might never buy. They may never buy, right? Yes. Yeah, so and, and I know a lot of investment bankers think that way, but as an attorney, it's not. I guess it's yeah, not as big a deal because you're generating fees either, either way. Either way, yeah. right? Yeah, I think it's you know the level of preparedness, right? If if mm -hmm. you're a seller, it's it's getting the business ready and prime for sale, right? There's a lot of work that mm -hmm. needs to happen, right? And then as a buyer. You know, there's obviously a lot of due diligence that needs to happen, right, on whatever your target is going to be. And so, yeah, I, I enjoy m and I think it's fantastic work. Um, you know, obviously there are some markets right now that m and is just hot, you know, tech. And mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of consolidation in tech. You're seeing a lot in healthcare and pharmaceuticals, all of which areas I've – most of my work was a lot in – retail and you had a lot of franchises and things of that nature. So, um, it, it's a great space, but I, I played both sides of the table for sure. So what mistakes do you see? And you may not have been advising them when they were startups, but what, yeah. when a company is a startup early in their existence, are there things that they mistakes that they make that later on become very expensive in the M and a process? Yeah. I, I think John, the biggest thing that I've seen 
particularly for like tech startups, is just not maintaining their cap tables, right? Mm. That's a that's a freaking nightmare, yeah. right? Just because you're so early on. And then you have to put you, it back. You, so you so gotta, for the listeners who don't know, I think most of them probably do, but a cap yeah. table is just a, an Excel spreadsheet typically, or maybe it's in Carta, and it lists out all the different owners and all the different terms that they have. Yeah. In, in the real estate world, they call it a waterfall, uh-huh. um, but it lists out here's who has preferences, here's who has common stock, here's who has convertible notes, notes right. and, and it lets you ultimately calculate what percentage ownership a given employee Employees, or yeah. investor or Absolutely. founder has. Yeah, yeah. And, and because of all of those nuances and the varying degrees of ownership, if it's not tracked properly by the time we get to the table, it's like, oh, we had these X amount of uh, convertible notes out there, but then there are two missing. There are ten, and then we're missing five and seven, right? Yeah. And so we, <laughs> we we don't we don't know what what's happening there. Um, and and so I I would say you know really good and diligent record keeping is going to be imperative with mm-hmm. regards to, and you're going to need it anyway with regards to you know investment due diligence mm-hmm. and so forth. Investors are going to want to know. When, and and you don't even you, you yeah. can't give out equity grants to employees that if you, you don't, don't have, have. Or, or that you, you yeah or they yeah. haven't been authorized. They, they're or, not <laughs> yeah. So so you know, and that's important, right? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of you know founders are just kind of willy nilly, just mm-hmm. kind of giving out equity and just throwing out numbers and then putting things on paper and executing documents, and then before you know it, you know you've overcapitalized the business, and to your point, you you've issued more stocks than you were authorized to issue. And now we have to do all these amendments and resolutions and we have to sort of right size things. And, and I think that could certainly be a turnoff for a a buyer um, because they don't know what they're getting. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I, and I think that sort of is a red flag with regards to just, just are, are there subsequent liabilities that I'm just unaware of, right? Am I yep. going to get some some wild investor to come out of the woodworks to say, hey, I have this promissory note that you guys need to honor, right? And and it, it's important, right? So yep. so I, I would say that is one of the biggest well, things. Well, buyers want to know I've who seen. they're buying it from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they, they want to know who they're dealing with, right? Yep. And, um, and I think that, that hurts – um, uh, the acquiring company's opportunity to, to really maintain some sort of ongoing relationship with the buyer. Cause most times, you know, they're bringing co-founders on, uh, in various roles. And I think that sort of erodes the level of trust in your ability to, to execute a department or lead a team mm-hmm. and so forth. And so I think it's, it's, it, it's bigger than just kind of a cap table. It's kind of the post sort of transaction and the relationship. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we have to clean a lot of that stuff up. Quite well, often. let's flip to the other side. Not that attorneys ever yeah. make mistakes, but what mistakes do you see attorneys <laughs> make when it comes to dealing with startups? <laughs> yeah, I, I think just with anything else, it's it's not asking the right questions and really just trying to understand how this opportunity fits kind of in the big picture of the organization, right? Because mm-hmm. it's like, you know, yeah, you acquire this company, but then, then what, right? Are you is it just the fact that you just want to squash them as a competitor and just not do anything with it? Or how does this sort of fit within your strategic mm-hmm. framework of growth? Um, and I, and I think some attorneys just, just want to do the deal, right? Let's just do the deal. And I don't really care about kind of what you do with it after that. And I, I think it, it does a disservice to the client to really understand. Let's, let's think through this. And it goes back to your initial uh, opening question around just kind of separating the legal and the business, mm-hmm. right? And it's just like, let's have a business conversation about what does this m and transaction mean for the business? And then kind of drill down from there to figure out what legal considerations we need to make to ensure the business is protected. Yep. Yeah, it's, it, that business versus legal distinction is so tough oh, to man. tell. Because oh, on man. one hand, you, you you say, hey, I just want legal advice. How do I have to word this? But on the other hand, attorneys see so many things. Oh, man, that we, we more have to. That, yeah, yeah we're, we're already at the Supreme Court. Like, <laughs> what if this damn thing went to the Supreme Court? How do we, how do we deal with it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you touched on this a little bit, um, but in talking about the mistakes that attorneys make when dealing with startups, what mistakes do large acquiring companies tend to make? when they acquire smaller companies. And again, you, you, you hinted at this a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously we we talk about the fact that large companies tend not to care about innovation as much in terms of internal innovation and they'll just sort of acquire these smaller companies mm -hmm. because they are innovating, right? Um, and then I think it then how do you carry through that innovative culture within the enterprise and so that there's this sort of integration consideration or, or bottleneck with regards mm -hmm. to like – it's certainly frustrating, right, for a new, smaller, acquired company that's super innovative, very progressive to get sort of absorbed into this larger enterprise that's antithetical to like, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, all of this growth. And so, you know, I think that is really the opportunity for large enterprise to say, I think they make a, a huge mistake with underappreciating the level of innovation that's required. Um, and not allowing the true value of that smaller company to thrive within the larger ecosystem of their four walls, right? And I think that, that to me, undercuts the value of the acquisition to which that you're not getting the true value that you purchased. Yeah, we saw that. Luckily, we were the, the first good example where Red Hat... So, so I used to be the COO of a firm called yep. Mentra that was acquired by Red Hat. And we... Um, were the first acquisition done under Jim Whitehurst, who steered the company to amazing heights. I mean, the biggest exit in the history of tech was IBM buying Red Hat for thirty-four billion, and 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 um, Jim was hired back when they were a four hundred million dollar company. Wow. And so we were the the prior administration was initiated the transaction. The board pulled Jim to the side yeah. and said, "We've <clears throat> ruined. I, I won't say ruined, but we we haven't done." We haven't had a good track record of acquisitions yeah. and, and unlocking value. And so your biggest job is to make sure this thing doesn't fail. Uh, they use the more colorful F word than <laughs> fail. <laughs> and Jim sat Putting us down. Putting it mildly. J yeah. Jim sat us down and told us that. And he said, look, we are we are going to err on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. I want you to keep your Amentra email addresses, keep yeah. your laptops, keep your tech stack, <clears throat> keep selling to your existing customers. You don't have to do Red Hat technology. Yeah. And it was, it was so interesting to see they were so scarred by the prior acquisitions because it's real easy you make an acquisition and yeah. then you think this has to work the same way we do and what jim saw is that where they were trying to go is from selling the system selling linux to system administrators to what they executed on which is sure. selling selling to the business you're selling yeah. transformation to businesses business. yeah. and, and that and that's why ultimately <laughs> ibm acquired them uh, it was really interesting to see that we were lucky not a horror story mm -hmm. but we met we worked very closely with people from prior acquisitions who there was a lot of carnage, a lot of turnover, a lot Absolutely. of culture clash. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's hard for it's, it's hard. small companies like Red Hat was at the time to be able yeah. to look at how do we do this yeah. better. Yeah. And and I think you alluded to a, a strong point with regards to, you know, just culture and, and then just general fit. What are we going to do with this, right, yeah. post-closure and how do we exit? And there's really not a clear plan. It's like, I love what you're doing. I think that's pretty cool. I think we should acquire you. But then it's like, well, how are we going to execute on this within this new framework, yeah. with these resources and talent? Um, I think that and, there's and a ratio of size where, and you can correct me on this because yeah, you've seen yeah. a lot more of these yeah. transactions yeah. that I have, but I felt like we were probably a 20 to $25 million a year revenue company, depending mm -hmm. on what 12 months you're looking at, yeah. you know, yeah. forward or backward sure. looking. Um, in a $400 million company. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was just, we were big enough to matter enough to their bottom line revenue that they couldn't kill <laughs> that mm -hmm. revenue. That It was meaningful. If you're 400 million and you add 25 million, you care about every dollar of that. Every 25 <laughs> damn penny. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can imagine that if an IBM, who's, uh, I don't know how far they've shrunk, but they were yeah. at one point a hundred billion dollar a year company. Mm -hmm. If they acquire a twenty five million dollar company, I think it's a whole different ball game. I also think that if a twenty million dollar business tries to buy a twenty five million dollar business, there's going to be it's yeah, going to be tougher, tough, right? It's tougher. Yeah. yeah, no, I think there's a lot of validity to right the valuation of the dollars, the, the relative the sizes. Yeah, yeah. 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 oh, absolutely, yeah. right? Because you know. You see companies just for kicks and giggles just buy up twenty, thirty million dollar companies just to get them out of the marketplace, have no intentions to doing absolutely anything, but you talk about four hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what the hell are we gonna do with this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> we need you to we need you to turn around and make us a billion dollars, right? Uh, and that so so yeah, I, I think there's a stark difference between you know revenue thresholds with these yeah. deals. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, Bobby, this has been great. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for coming over to the Angels Rise. Yeah, side. man. This is <laughs> you know I can always depend on you to introduce me to various. Th- luxuries of, of, of beverages so i appreciate it <laughs> it's not all just coffee Sometimes no it no it can be bourbon man <laughs> yeah when you threw that on the table i'm like i'm definitely in right now all right so before we do sign off are there any other things you would like to touch on or groups companies you would like to promote or no man I, i'm just working hard to build this influencer attorney brand and so i'm really just trying to connect with you know, brands and agencies and influencers that are working uh, together and and need some support in terms of just general brand protection, including athletes. So, you know, I know you're big into sports. And so, you know, there's this whole, you know, movement with student athletes monetizing their brand. And so, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. So Micah, Maneric would kill yeah, me if I yeah. didn't. He, 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 and I, he and I spoke about it. We, we, we had a conversation about his daughter. Uh, so I, I sent him an article that I had written uh, about this particular topic, and, and I'm actually working with the firm on putting out some additional content. So, tell, so. talk to me about this. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, not not specific to Micah's daughter. Yeah, but I, yeah. I understand she's a soccer player soccer for Clemson. Player she Clemson. committed to Clemson. Yep, yep. So, so the, but not specific uh, to that, but just sure. in general, what's the, what's the sure. concept? Sure. So, here? so the concept is that uh, historically, NCAA has prohibited student athletes from um, endorsing products or services or monetizing their brand for compensation, right? So that they they feel as though it sort of violates the whole rule of amateur sports, right? Mm -hmm. And so it kind of puts student athletes on a professional level if they were to be compensated, right? Which is crazy to me because when I was an accounting major in undergrad, I would have been lauded (laughs) <laughs> for finding a way to make money absolutely off of and, and it's and it's interesting because <laughs> yeah. you're absolutely right everyone on campus can make money but student athletes mm-hmm. right um and and so uh there has been a push to allow student athletes to to now monetize their brands look these these kids are i say kids but you know they're they're monetizing their social media they have huge followings on social media um, and they have every right, you know, to. Oh, how to, many followers did Zion Williamson Zion have? Zion had Duke? he had a crazy amount, but I I can't remember the kid um, from Clemson, the the quarterback. Uh, oh, Trevor, 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 yeah, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence, Lawrence. yeah, Trevor yeah, Lawrence, yeah, Trevor Lawrence, yeah, yeah, is a yeah uh, very different the TV, TV, yeah, TV, yeah. TV, <laughs> TV, TV house. Um, I blame it on the Angels. Yeah, maybe. blame it on the Angels. Maybe. Um, but he had like a massive. There was like a study done in terms of like how much he could he could make like per year. And I think at the time it was like a million dollars or something Mm -hmm. like that and like endorsements. And so uh, anyway, the the NCAA is, is uh, reviewing the rules to, to change that. Of course, there's going to be some stipulations around them not partnering with brands that also sponsor the, the institution and things of that nature or sponsoring products that, may not be good for the body, right? So maybe CBD products or some other products mm-hmm. that they could not endorse. So there, there's going to be some restrictions. But the interesting thing is, though, that there are some states that have gotten ahead of the NCAA, such as Florida and California and Nevada, and they're using it as a recruitment tool to say, hey, come to our schools. Um, you can monetize your brand. You know, you use the sort of the platform of the school. So a lot of schools are using it as recruitment tools to get some of the top talent to their institutions. And so what I'm doing now is really just helping these kids kind of start thinking about, um, you know, do I form an LLC? Do I file a trademark? Do I get a domain name? Do you mm-hmm. know, like there, there are domain name squatters who will look at the top athletes in high school and will acquire all of I didn't know that but I'm not surprised to hear (laughs) it. They will acquire and then try to sell it back to you for thousands of dollars and of course there's legislation around you know there's existing legislation to kind of push back on that but it happens all the time and I mean it happened to the Washington Redskins like there was a a guy who kind of like bought up all the trademarks for, you know, the Washington Redskins potential 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 renames that they did he pick a Washington football team because that was yeah right that was kind of why you ended up with that name. (laughs) 
<laughs> I happen to be a football team fan, yeah, yeah. long suffering. There you go. There you go. So, so that, that's why you ended up with that name because there's this guy out there with that. Um, so, so that's a huge opportunity. And in my, my estimation, I think student athletes will become the next rising class of influencers um, to which that I can see them with sports apparel brands and vitamin supplements and all the, you know, music and mm -hmm. all the things that sort of, you know, sort of aligns with the brand, you know, lip, you know, weightlifting equipment, all of that. So, you know, really just kind of positioning myself to kind of help educate those guys and everybody's kind of getting out there to, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a damn well, shit storm if it's that's one managed. that's been yeah. so tough for me I, yeah. I i just feel like the ncaa um it, it it's hypocrisy to to take these athletes and to say we're not going to pay you oh my gosh and they're, yet they're making co a, the coaches make how much money the universities make how dollars. much money and yeah. it's, it's, it's millions and billions of well, dollars at, you, at, at the elite universities yeah you think about like ea sports mm -hmm. and you know i i saw something where they they re-enter the whole gaming thing right and then you know they've just sort of stripped name image and likeness from it so you kind of have these generic players uh, without numbers or anything of that nature um at the ncaa at, level at, at not the at the NCAA, NCAA level correct the, yeah. correct and so you know that's really important so i'm really really excited to see where this space goes i think it's going to be great mm -hmm. um but I think for the initial several years, it's just going to be the wild, wild west until, you know, folks, there's a consistency in the application of law. You know, every right now, it seems to be patchwork that every state's kind of going to do their own thing until yeah. um, either the NCAA or Congress or some federal law is enacted to kind of provide some consistency in terms of how this thing is um, facilitated. But well, um, these type of tests, though, I think are what really and, and I'm an outsider. I don't I'm not certainly an expert on NCAA, yeah. but it seems like the conference, the power conferences have more power than oh the God. NCAA. And if they yeah. can't figure out some guidelines around this, why? Why does it even exist? You're going to. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think over time and I, I think I think you just hit the nail on the head with regards to just their ability to stronghold their well, influence. Picture the SEC. If the SEC decides we're or oh, ACC decides oh my gosh, we're doing we're this, we're going to do it. it. It it diminishes their opportunity, right? And mm -hmm. and I mean, you think about just recruitment and the vitality of the conference overall with regards to talent. Mm -hmm. It's 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 going to be an interesting opportunity, and I I never thought about just mm -hmm. the, even the conference angle, right? Because you're not the only game in town, but yeah. you definitely are super significant with regards to, you know, just, um, you know, NCAA, everyone just sort of, that's the conference, that's the go-to conference, right? You yeah. know? Well, it, it was interesting to me <clears throat> just to see <clears throat> how some of the, the more powerful conferences like Big Ten, and, and this we saw this in football yeah. and yeah. in basketball. The with whole COVID. thing about, yeah, who's going to play and who's going to play ourselves. not, right, yeah, yeah. 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 And, that, that that's that's a really interesting dynamic i um I, it, it it just feels so broken to me and there's so many scandals around the ncaa it's it, that's one of the institutions that i'm just completely fed up with mm -hmm. in our country mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's my own personal bias yeah. but it's, yeah. it's frustrating for sure yeah and i think i think it's time for a change right mm -hmm. to your point um your your roommate shouldn't be able to to monetize their brand yeah. and, and 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 you can't just because you got a scholarship to play football yeah, it, it right. just seems it, unfair if I, it's, it's just, if, yeah. if I can review, you know, online video games or unboxing of things and, and I can make millions of dollars millions on of it, dollars. but, I, but yeah. you're telling me that yeah. I, because I'm making hundreds of millions of dollars for my university, I can't make any money. That, that's just fundamentally unfair. It's, it's to flawed. Yeah. It's flawed. Right. And I think many of these kids come from various backgrounds to which that, um, those, those dollars could to, to your point, right. You, you think about, uh, a small percentage of them will actually go pro, mm -hmm. but this could certainly be a different path to generational wealth or economic yep. equality if they're able to sort of maintain some some you know reputable presence for themselves on online. Um, and you see that right. Many of them are getting into media and mm -hmm. becoming other personalities and getting into entrepreneurship, and and that could certainly be a springboard 
if they're able to to monetize their brand in a meaningful way. So I'm really excited and, um, you know, happy to kind of be a part of that ecosystem, you know, in terms of helping these kids with brand protection. Yep. Well, that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Micah literally was like, you got to ask him about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, uh, we, we spoke about it. I, I sent him, sent him the article. Um, and I, I think, yeah, I'd love to come back, man. And, 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 really talk sports and, and yeah. legal and all that good stuff. I know that's outside of VC, but I think there's definitely going to be a lot of tech platforms around, you know, connecting athletes to brands and a lot of opportunity mm-hmm. there. And I think, you know, um, it, it's going to create a whole new space, um, you know, um, of opportunity. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Well, look, man, I'm, I'm sorry that we took this long to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, no, it, it feels like our days at the coffee like, shop. Oh, <laughs> my gosh, man. You know, we'd spend hours. Just with there. a microphone and oh, bright it. lights and yeah. a camera. And, and, I think and I think Undercurrent was the name Undercurrent of that. Undercurrent is the name yeah, of it. Thank that you. Shout shop. out to Undercurrent. Shout That's out a great to, coffee I shop. I love <laughs> Undercurrent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, brother. I appreciate yeah, you, likewise, you coming man. on board. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And thank we'll you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. All right. Cheers. Appreciate it.